The House of the Seven Gables by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Chapter 10. The Pynchon Garden. Clifford, except for Phoebe's more active instigation, would ordinarily have yielded to the torpor which had crept through all his modes of being, and which sluggishly counseled him to sit in his morning chair till eventide. But the girl seldom failed to propose a removal to the garden, where Uncle Venner and the daguerreotypist had made such repairs on the roof of the ruinous arbor or summer house that it was now a sufficient shelter from sunshine and casual showers. The hop vine, too, had begun to grow luxuriantly over the sides of the little edifice, and made an interior of verdant seclusion with innumerable peeps and glimpses into the wider solitude of the garden. Here, sometimes in this green play-place of flickering light, Phoebe read to Clifford. Her acquaintance, the artist, who appeared to have a literary turn, had supplied her with works of fiction in pamphlet form, and a few volumes of poetry in altogether a different style and taste from those which Hepzibah selected for his amusement. Small thanks were due to the books, however, if the girl's readings were in any degree more successful than her elderly cousin's. Phoebe's voice had always a pretty music in it, and could either enliven Clifford by its sparkle and gaiety of tone, or soothe him by a continued flow of pebbly and brook-like cadences. But the fictions in which the country girl, unused to works of that nature, often became deeply absorbed, interested her strange auditor very little, nor not at all. Pictures of life, scenes of passion or sentiment, wit, humor, and pathos were all thrown away, or worse than thrown away on Clifford, either because he lacked an experience by which to test their truth, or because his own griefs were a touchstone of reality that few feigned emotions could withstand. When Phoebe broke into a peal of merry laughter at what she read, he would now and then laugh for sympathy, but oftener respond with a troubled, questioning look. If a tear, a maiden's sunshiny tear over imaginary woe, dropped upon some melancholy page... Clifford either took it as a token of actual calamity or else grew peevish and angrily motioned her to close the volume. And wisely, too. Is not the world sad enough in genuine earnest without making a pastime of mock sorrows? With poetry, it was rather better. He delighted in the swell and subsidence of the rhythm and the happily recurring rhyme. Nor was Clifford incapable of feeling the sentiment of poetry not perhaps where it was highest or deepest, but where it was most fitting and ethereal. It was impossible to foretell in what exquisite verse the awakening spell might lurk, but on raising her eyes from the page to Clifford's face, Phoebe would be made aware by the light breaking through it that a more delicate intelligence than her own had caught a lambent flame from what she read. One glow of this kind, however, was often the precursor of gloom for many hours afterward, because, when the glow left him, he seemed conscious of a missing sense and power, and groped about for them as if a blind man should go seeking his lost eyesight. It pleased him more, and was better for his inward welfare, that Phoebe should talk and make passing occurrences vivid to his mind by her accompanying description and remarks. The life of the garden offered topics enough for such discourse as suited Clifford best. He never failed to inquire what flowers had bloomed since yesterday. His feeling for flowers was very exquisite, and seemed not so much a taste as an emotion. He was fond of sitting with one in his hand, intently observing it, and looking from its petals into Phoebe's face as if the garden flower were the sister of the household maiden. Not merely was there a delight in the flower's perfume, or pleasure in its beautiful form, and the delicacy or brightness of its hue, but Clifford's enjoyment was accompanied with a perception of life, character, and individuality that made him love these blossoms of the garden as if they were endowed with sentiment and intelligence. This affection and sympathy for flowers is almost exclusively a woman's trait. Men, if endowed with it by nature, soon lose, forget, and learn to despise it in their contact with coarser things than flowers. 
Clifford, too, had long forgotten it, but found it again, now as he slowly revived from the chill torpor of his life. It is wonderful how many pleasant incidents continually came to pass in that secluded garden spot when once Phoebe had set herself to look for them. She had seen or heard a bee there on the very first day of her acquaintance with the place, and often, almost continually indeed, since then, the bees kept coming thither, heaven knows why, or by what pertinacious desire for far-fetched sweets, when no doubt there were broad clover fields and all kinds of garden growth much nearer home than this. Thither the bees came, however, and plunged into the squash blossoms as if there were no other squash vines within a long day's flight, or as if the soil of Hepzibah's garden gave its productions just the very quality which these laborious little wizards wanted in order to impart the hymetous odor to their whole hive of New England honey. When Clifford heard their sunny buzzing murmur in the heart of the great yellow blossoms, he looked about him with a joyful sense of warmth and blue sky and green grass and of God's free air in the whole height from heaven to earth. After all, there need be no question why the bees came to that one green nook in the dusty town. God sent them thither to gladden our poor Clifford. They brought the rich summer with them in requital of a little honey. When the bean vines began to flower on the poles, there was one particular variety which bore a vivid scarlet blossom. The daguerreotypist had found these beans in a garret over one of the seven gables, treasured up in an old chest of drawers by some horticultural pension of days gone by, who doubtless meant to sow them the next summer, but was himself first sown in death's garden ground. By way of testing whether there was still a living germ in such ancient seeds, Holgrave had planted some of them, and the result of his experiment was a splendid row of bean vines clambering early to the full height of the poles and arraying them from top to bottom in a spiral profusion of red blossoms. And ever since the unfolding of the first bud, a multitude of hummingbirds had been attracted thither. At times, it seemed as if for every one of the hundred blossoms there was one of these tiniest fowls of the air, a thumb's bigness of burnished plumage, hovering and vibrating about the bean poles. It was with indescribable interest and even more than childish delight that Clifford watched the hummingbirds. He used to thrust his head softly out of the arbor to see them the better, all the while, too, motioning Phoebe to be quiet and snatching glimpses of the smile upon her face so as to heap his enjoyment up the higher with her sympathy. He had not merely grown young, he was a child again. Hepzibah, whenever she happened to witness one of these fits of miniature enthusiasm, would shake her head with a strange mingling of the mother and sister and of pleasure and sadness in their aspect. She said that it always had been thus with Clifford when the hummingbirds came, always, from his babyhood, and that his delight in them had been one of the earliest tokens by which he showed his love for beautiful things. And it was a wonderful coincidence, the good lady thought, that the artist should have planted these scarlet flowering beans which the hummingbirds sought far and wide, and which had not grown in the pinchin garden before for forty years on the very summer of Clifford's return. Then, would the tears stand in poor Hepzibah's eyes, or overflow them with a too abundant gush, so that she was fain to betake herself into some corner, lest Clifford should espy her agitation. Indeed, all the enjoyments of this period were provocative of tears. Coming so late as it did, it was a kind of Indian summer, with a mist in its balmiest sunshine and decay and death in its goddess delight. The more Clifford seemed to taste the happiness of a child, the sadder was the difference to be recognized. With a mysterious and terrible past which had annihilated his memory and a blank future before him, he had only this visionary and impalpable now, which, if you once look closely at it, is nothing. He himself, as was perceptible by many symptoms, lay darkly behind his pleasure and knew it to be a baby play which he was to toy and trifle with instead of thoroughly believing. Clifford saw, it may be, in the mirror of his deeper consciousness, that he was an example and representative of that great class of people whom an inexplicable providence is continually putting at cross-purposes with the world, breaking what seems its own promise in their nature, withholding their proper food and setting poison before them for a banquet, and thus, when it might so easily as one would think have been adjusted otherwise, making their existence a strangeness a solitude, and torment. 
All his life long, he had been learning how to be wretched as one learns a foreign tongue, and now, with the lesson thoroughly at heart, he could with difficulty comprehend his little airy happiness. Frequently, there was a dim shadow of doubt in his eyes. Take my hand, Phoebe, he would say, and pinch it hard with your little fingers. Give me a rose that I may press its thorns and prove myself awake by the sharp touch of pain. Evidently, he desired this prick of a trifling anguish in order to assure himself by that quality which he best knew to be real that the garden and the seven weather-beaten gables and Hepzibah's scowl and Phoebe's smile were real likewise. Without this signet in his flesh, he could have contributed no more substance to them than to the empty confusion of imaginary scenes with which he had fed his spirit until even that poor sustenance was exhausted. The author needs great faith in his reader's sympathy, else he must hesitate to give details so minute and incidents apparently so trifling as are essential to make up the idea of this garden life. It was the Eden of a thunder-smitten Adam who had fled for refuge thither out of the same dreary and perilous wilderness into which the original Adam was expelled. One of the available means of amusement, of which Phoebe made the most in Clifford's behalf, was that feathered society, the Hens, a breed of whom, as we have already said, was an immemorial heirloom in the Pynchon family. In compliance with the whim of Clifford, as it troubled him to see them in confinement, they had been set at liberty and now roamed at will about the garden, doing some little mischief, but hindered from escape by buildings on three sides and the difficult peaks of a wooden fence on the other. They spent much of their abundant leisure on the margin of Maul's Well, which was haunted by a kind of a snail, evidently a tidbit to their palates, and the brackish water itself, however nauseous to the rest of the world, was so greatly esteemed by these fowls that they might be seen tasting, turning up their heads, and smacking their bills with precisely the air of wine-bibbers around a probationary cask. They're generally quiet, yet often brisk and constantly diversified talk, one to another, or sometimes in soliloquy, as they scratched worms out of the rich black soil, or pecked at such plants as suited their taste, had such a domestic tone that it was almost a wonder why you could not establish a regular interchange of ideas about household matters, human and gallinaceous. All hens are well worth studying for the piquancy and rich variety of their manners, but by no possibility can there have been other fowls of such odd appearance and deportment as these ancestral ones. They probably embodied the traditionary peculiarities of their whole line of progenitors derived through an unbroken succession of eggs, or else this individual Chanticleer and his two wives had grown to be humorists and a little crack-brained withal on account of their solitary way of life and out of sympathy for Hepzibah, their lady patroness. Queerly, indeed, they looked. Chanticleer himself, though stalking on two stilt-like legs with the dignity of interminable descent in all his gestures, was hardly bigger than an ordinary partridge. His two wives were about the size of quails, and, as for the one chicken, it looked small enough to be still in the egg and at the same time sufficiently old, withered, wizened, and experienced to have been the founder of the antiquated race. Instead of being the youngest of the family, it seemed rather to have aggregated into itself the ages, not only of these living specimens of the breed, but of all its forefathers and foremothers whose united excellences and oddities were squeezed into its little body. Its mother evidently regarded it as the one chicken of the world, and as necessary, in fact, to the world's continuance, or at any rate to the equilibrium of the present system of affairs, whether in church or state. No lesser sense of the infant fowl's importance could have justified, even in a mother's eyes, the perseverance with which she watched over its safety, ruffling her small person to twice its proper size, and flying in everybody's face that so much as looked towards her hopeful progeny. No lower estimate could have vindicated the indefatigable zeal with which she scratched, and her unscrupulousness in digging up the choicest flower or vegetable for the sake of the fat earthworm at its root. Her nervous cluck, when the chicken happened to be hidden in the long grass or under the squash leaves, her gentle croak of satisfaction, while sure of it beneath her wing, her note of ill-concealed fear and obstreperous defiance when she saw her arch-enemy, a neighbor's cat, on the top of the high fence. One or other of these sounds was to be heard at almost every moment of the day. By degrees, 
the observer came to feel nearly as much interest in this chicken of the illustrious race as the mother hen did. Phoebe, after getting well acquainted with the old hen, was sometimes permitted to take the chicken in her hand, which was quite capable of grasping its cubic inch or two of body. While she curiously examined its hereditary marks, the peculiar speckle of its plumage, the funny tuft on its head, and a knob on each of its legs, the little biped, as she insisted, kept giving her a sagacious wink. The daguerreotypist once whispered her that these marks betokened the oddities of the Pynchon family, and that the chick itself was a symbol of the life of the old house, embodying its interpretation likewise, although an unintelligible one, as such clues generally are. It was a feathered riddle, a mystery hatched out of an egg, and just as mysterious as if the egg had been addle. The second of Chanticleer's two wives, ever since Phoebe's arrival, had been in a state of heavy despondency, caused, as it afterwards appeared, by her inability to lay an egg. One day, however, by her self-important gait, the sideway turn of her head, and the cock of her eye as she pried into one and another nook of the garden, croaking to herself all the while with inexpressible complacency, it was made evident that this identical hen, much as mankind undervalued her, carried something about her person, the worth of which was not to be estimated either in gold or precious stones. Shortly after, there was a prodigious cackling and gratulation of Chanticleer and all his family, including the wizened chicken, who appeared to understand the matter quite as well as did his sire, his mother, or his aunt. That afternoon, Phoebe found a diminutive egg, not in the regular nest, it was far too precious to be trusted there, but cunningly hidden under the currant bushes on some dry stalks of last year's grass. Hepzibah, on learning the fact, took possession of the egg and appropriated it to Clifford's breakfast on account of a certain delicacy of flavor for which, as she affirmed, these eggs had always been famous. Thus unscrupulously did the old gentlewoman sacrifice the continuance, perhaps, of an ancient feathered race with no better end than to supply her brother with a dainty that hardly filled the bowl of a teaspoon. It must have been in reference to this outrage that Chanticleer the next day, accompanied by the bereaved mother of the egg, took his post in front of Phoebe and Clifford and delivered himself of a harangue that might have been proved as long as his own pedigree, but for a fit of merriment on Phoebe's part. Hereupon the offended fowl stalked away on his long stilts and utterly withdrew his nose from Phoebe and the rest of the human nature until she made her peace with an offering of spice cake which, next to snails, was the delicacy most in favor with his aristocratic taste. We linger too long, no doubt, beside this paltry rivulet of life that flowed through the garden of the Pynchon House. But we deem it pardonable to record these mean incidents and poor delights because they proved so greatly to Clifford's benefit. They had the earth smell in them and contributed to give him health and substance. Some of his occupations wrought less desirably upon him. He had a singular propensity, for example, to hang over Maul's well and look at the constantly shifting phantasmagoria of figures produced by the agitation of the water over the mosaic work of colored pebbles at the bottom. He said that faces looked upward to him there, beautiful faces, arrayed in bewitching smiles, each momentary face so fair and rosy, and every smile so sunny that he felt wronged at its departure until the same flitting witchcraft made a new one. But sometimes he would suddenly cry out, The dark face gazes at me, and be miserable the whole day afterwards. Phoebe, when she hung over by the fountain by Clifford's side, could see nothing of all this, neither the beauty nor the ugliness, but only the colored pebbles, looking as if the gush of the water shook and disarranged them, and the dark face that so troubled Clifford was no more than the shadow thrown from a branch of one of the damson trees and breaking the inner light of Maul's well. The truth was, however, that his fancy, reviving faster than his will and judgment and always stronger than they, created shapes of loveliness that were symbolic of his native character, and now and then a stern and dreadful shape that typified his fate. On Sundays, after Phoebe had been at church, for the girl had a church-going conscience, and would hardly have been at ease had she missed either prayer, singing, sermon, or benediction after church time, therefore there was ordinarily a sober little festival in the garden. In addition to Clifford, Hepzibah, and Phoebe, two guests made up the company. One was the artist, Holgrave, who, in spite of his 
consociation with reformers and his other queer and questionable traits continued to hold an elevated place in Hepzibah's regard. The other, we are almost ashamed to say, was the venerable Uncle Venner in a clean shirt and a broadcloth coat, more respectable than his ordinary wear inasmuch as it was neatly patched on each elbow and might be called an entire garment, except for a slight inequality in the length of its skirts. Clifford, on several occasions, had seemed to enjoy the old man's intercourse for the sake of his mellow, cheerful vein, which was like the sweet flavor of a frost-bitten apple, such as one picks up under the tree in December. A man at the very lowest point of the social scale was easier and more agreeable for the fallen gentleman to encounter than a person at any of the intermediate degrees. And moreover, as Clifford's young manhood had been lost, he was fond of feeling himself comparatively youthful now in apposition with the patriarchal age of Uncle Venner. In fact, it was sometimes observable that Clifford half willfully hid from himself the consciousness of being stricken in years and cherished visions of an earthly future still before him, visions, however, too indistinctly drawn to be followed by disappointment, though doubtless by depression, when any casual incident or recollection made him sensible of the withered leaf. So this oddly composed little social party used to assemble under the ruinous arbor. Hepzibah, stately as ever, and yielding not an inch of her old gentility, but resting upon it so much the more as justifying a princess-like condescension, exhibited a not ungraceful hospitality. She talked kindly to the vagrant artist and took sage counsel, lady as she was, with the wood sawyer, the messenger of everybody's petty errands, the patched philosopher and Uncle Venner, who had studied the world at street corners and at other posts equally well adapted for just observation, was as ready to give out his wisdom as a town pump to give water. "'Miss Hepzibah, ma'am,' said he once, after they had all been cheerful together, "'I really enjoy these quiet little meetings of a Sabbath afternoon. They are very much like what I expect to have after I retire to my farm.' "'Uncle Venner,' observed Clifford in a drowsy, inward tone, "'is always talking about his farm. "'But I have a better scheme for him by and by. "'We, we shall see.' "'Ah, Mr. Clifford Pynchon,' said the man of patches, "'you may scheme for me as much as you please, "'but I'm not going to give up this one scheme of my own, "'even if I never bring it really to pass. "'It does seem to me that men make a wonderful mistake "'in trying to heap up property upon property. "'If I had done so, I should feel as if Providence "'was not bound to take care of me. "'And at all events, the city wouldn't be. "'I'm one of those people who think that infinity "'is big enough for us all, and eternity long enough.' "'Why, so they are, Uncle Venner,' remarked Phoebe after a pause. "'for she had been trying to fathom the profundity and appositeness "'of this concluding apothegm. "'But for this short life of ours, "'one would like a house and a moderate garden spot of one's own.' "'It appears to me,' said the daguerreotypist, smiling, "'that Uncle Venner has the principles of foyer at the bottom of his wisdom, "'only they have not quite so much distinctness in his mind "'as in that of the systematizing Frenchman. "'Come, Phoebe.' said Hepzibah. It's time to bring the currants. And then, while the yellow richness of the declining sunshine still fell into the open space of the garden, Phoebe brought out a loaf of bread and a china bowl of currants, freshly gathered from the bushes and crushed with sugar. These, with water, but not from the fountain of ill omen, close at hand, constituted all the entertainment. Meanwhile, Holgrave took some pains to establish an intercourse with Clifford, actuated, it might seem, entirely by an impulse of kindliness, in order that the present hour might be cheerfuller than most which the poor recluse had spent, or was destined yet to spend. Nevertheless, in the artist's deep, thoughtful, all-observant eyes, there was now and then an expression not sinister, but questionable, as if he had some other interest in the scene than a stranger, a youthful and unconnected adventurer, might be supposed to have. With great nobility of outward mood, however, he applied himself to the task of enlivening the party, and with so much success that even dark hued Hepzibah threw off one tint of melancholy and made what shift she could with the remaining portion. Phoebe said to herself, "'How pleasant he can be!' 
As for Uncle Venner, as a mark of friendship and approbation, he readily confessed to afford the young man his countenance in the way of his profession. Not metaphorically, be it understood, but literally by allowing a daguerreotype of his face so familiar to the town to be exhibited at the entrance of Holgrave's studio. Clifford, as the company partook of their little banquet, grew to be the gayest of them all. Either it was one of those up-quivering flashes of the spirit to which minds in an abnormal state are liable, or else the artist had subtly touched some chord that made musical vibration. Indeed, what with the pleasant summer evening and the sympathy of this little circle of not unkindly souls, it was perhaps natural that a character so susceptible as Clifford's should become animated and show itself readily responsive to what was said around him. But he gave out his own thoughts, likewise, with an airy and fanciful glow, so that they glistened, as it were, through the arbor and made their escape among the interstices of the foliage. He had been as cheerful, no doubt, while alone with Phoebe, but never with such tokens of acute, although partial, intelligence. But as the sunlight left the peaks of the Seven Gables, so did the excitement fade out of Clifford's eyes. He gazed vaguely and mournfully about him, as if he missed something precious, and missed it the more drearily for not knowing precisely what it was. "'I want my happiness!' At last he murmured hoarsely and indistinctly, hardly shaping out the words. "'Many, many years have I waited for it. It is late. It is late. I want my happiness!' Alas, poor Clifford, you are old and worn with troubles that ought never to have befallen you. You are partly crazy and partly imbecile, a ruin, a failure, as almost everybody is, though some in less degree or less perceptibly than their fellows. Fate has no happiness in store for you unless your quiet home in the old family residence with the faithful Hepzibah and your long summer afternoons with Phoebe and these Sabbath festivals with Uncle Venner and the daguerreotypist deserve to be called happiness. Why not? If not the thing itself, it is marvelously like it and the more so for that ethereal and intangible quality which causes it all to vanish at too close an introspection. Take it, therefore, while you may. Murmur not, question not, but make the most of it. The end of chapter 10 Read by Rick 